Well, you heard him. He left me open to talk about anything and everything that I wanted to. Uh, he, he said, for the men. That's the topic that I got. And I didn't see the other topics. I'm not positive what all's been covered. I, I can imagine what might have been covered in a uh, series on strengthening the family. And, and, and I don't know if there have been separate men's and women's classes all along. But just thinking about uh, what could strengthen the family for men, we, we could go a lot of different directions. Uh, we could talk about uh, being a, a leader in the church, and, and I don't mean just being a shepherd or a deacon. Uh, we could talk about how anyone that's in the church should be shepherding and deaconing, <laughs> serving. Uh, because somebody told me once a long time ago that you don't ask someone to be a shepherd of the church that's not already shepherding. So that would be a good topic for us to go over. We, we could also talk about uh, strengthening the family, uh, uh, what it means to be a husband and a father. I'll bet that might have been something that has been taught here in strengthening the family. And I know some of you probably aren't married that are in here, and, and that's okay. I remember before I got married, I wanted to know about how to be a good husband and a good father. I was uh, going to school in Chattanooga, and I would be up there during the week, and I would come home on the weekends because I like mama's cooking. Uh, I like getting my clothes washed. I like those things. And, uh, so I would come home. Well, along the way, I collected a paper bag that was filled with cassette tapes. Looking around, there, there's maybe a couple of you here don't know what a cassette tape is because this was way back in the 1900s when this happened. And, <laughs> But I had cassette tapes of the Burkeen and Faulkner Marriage Enrichment Seminar. I wasn't married. I, you know, you think about somebody goes to a marriage enrichment seminar because they want to have their marriage enriched. But I wasn't married. But I listened to those over and over again, driving back and forth to Chattanooga. Why? Because I figured one day I was going to get married. And uh, I might need to know what I'm doing when I get there. So that kind of preparedness. Yeah, we could talk about those things, but, but I have a topic I'd like to talk about. Is, is anyone in the projection booth that can advance my slides? Good. Uh, I'll, I'll just call for you to advance them when I need to advance. How about that? I, I want to talk to you this evening about being unashamed of the Christian, of the Christian servant, Christian father, Christian husband, Christian son, Christian grandfather, being unashamed of the way that you serve. And, and, and this is how I want to introduce it. I, I'm going to share with you. Oh, there's a clock right there. Good. I was fixing to pull my phone out and lay it down. You know why preachers lay their phone on the podium or pull off their watch and lay it on the podium when they're speaking? Any idea? There's really no reason. It's just... So we, we, we want to talk about being unashamed. And this is how I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to share with you two stories. And then we're going to open our Bibles and we're going to look at four separate accounts in the Gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, all four record this very small snippet that we're going to wrap this lesson up with. Does anybody here listen to podcasts? I, I'm always looking for a good podcast, and uh, Ben and Travis, uh, our CYC guys, they, they have a good podcast. Lonnie Jones has a good podcast. Uh, let's see, there's, there's another one. It's not part of our CYC crew, but it's one that I know a lot of people like to listen to. It's called Holy Ghost Stories. Uh, those are some you might listen to. But then uh, I, I like to listen to podcasts that are outside of uh, re religious topics and I, I listen to those and I, I try to find ways to make application from them and lessons and devotionals and there's one and uh, I guess my, my NASA background kind of led me into this one it's called 13 minutes to the moon has anyone ever listened to 13 minutes to the moon if, if you haven't look it up when, when I found it there were probably about five episodes or so that had already been released so I got to, to binge listen to those but, but then after that, they only released one a week. And, and at the end of it, and, and I'm not, uh, this isn't, I'm not, 
I'm not ruining it for you and telling you this because they talk about how they're going to do it. At the end of it, on the last episode, they, they play the, the 13 minutes that Apollo 11 spent uh, leaving the moon's orbit and, and traveling down to the moon. And, all, and, and you get to hear that uninterrupted uh, with the conversations between uh, the astronauts and mission control. And you get to hear about all the alarms that were going off. And, and you know, there, was just, there was a lot of concern. There was a, a lot of things that were, uh, it had to happen just perfectly. And things didn't happen perfectly, but they still landed. I bet you some of you in here right now probably remember where you were in July of 1969 when they announced that Neil Armstrong had set foot on the moon. That's just something you don't forget. In the process of the story, in order to get to Apollo 11, though, my favorite episode in this podcast is episode 6. Episode 6 is titled, Saving 1968. Saving 1968. And uh, this is what, go ahead and go to the next slide because, uh, like I said, we just, let's see, July, that would have been 55 years ago. We just had the 55th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. Of these three ast astronauts, Frank Borman, he passed away just a month or two before that. Bill Anders, he passed away, I'm thinking, 22 or 23. Jim Lovell, uh, at this point, is the only one still living. And you recognize that Jim Lovell name from Apollo 13. Well, these are the astronauts from Apollo 8. And this is what is happening. 1968 was a, that was a bad year. That was a horrible year. Uh, there were uh, Martin Luther King Jr. got assassinated in 1968. Robert Kennedy was assassinated in 1968. There were some uh, bad things that happened on some college campuses that caused some riots. Vietnam was going on. There were people that were picketing and complaining about that. And it, it was just not a good year. And NASA was having all kinds of problems. Uh, this uh, Apollo, people talk about how Apollo was such a great vehicle. If you listen to this podcast, you're going to hear the leaders of NASA at that time saying, it was horrible, it was terrible. There were all kinds of problems with it. And, and the word came down because John Kennedy had said, before the end of this decade, we're going to go to the moon. Well, guess what? It wasn't happening until Apollo 8. And so... The, the young engineers, and I think the average age of these guys that accomplished this was about 25 years old. These were some young guys, but uh, they, were, they were called into the uh, director's office and they said, uh, look, we need to, we got 30 days. and We need to launch Apollo 8. And uh, we want to uh, take this mission, leave Earth's orbit, go up to the moon, turn around and come back. Y'all go home and think about it and uh, let me know if you think we can pull this off. Nobody's ever gotten a mission ready to go in that amount of time. That's impossible. That's not going to happen. Well, the guys that went home, they, they came back. They were already in the director's office before we got there and they were excited. They said, yeah, we can do it. We can do this, but we don't want to just go up to the moon and come back. We want to go up to the moon and enter orbit around the moon and then come back. And, that, and that's, that's a, a magnitude size of, of double. And the, the risk was there. The risk of uh, making it home alive was about 50-50. And that's what they wanted to do. And they, they let them take off and figure it out. And guess what? Here we are. Let me just share with you a few little facts about Apollo 8. It was launched December 21st, 1968. As we said, it was a year of turmoil. This was the first manned mission on the Saturn V. Saturn V, that was the rocket that they were having problems with. It was just terrible. This was the first manned mission to achieve the velocity of 25,000 miles per hour. That's how fast you have to be going to get out of Earth's orbit. 
These are some smart fellows. These guys, they're, they're geniuses. They could figure all this out. And they did it in just 30 days. It was the first manned mission to orbit the moon. I'll share more about that later. It was the first mission that traveled 200 and 50,000 miles away. And, and these, these were some of the most intelligent minds. And, and, and this is what they had to do. They had to determine what the thrust and velocity would be to leave the Earth's orbit. They, they had to figure out, once they got up there, what angle the engines would have to fire and how long those engines would have to fire to point the spacecraft towards the moon. But that's not all they had to know. These smart men and women, they had to know not pointing it to the moon. They had to point it to where the moon was going to be in three days. Figure that math out. And not just where the moon was going to be at in three days, but at a point six miles from where the, earth was, from where the moon was going to be that day because that's the point where they would enter orbit. That's not all. Uh, no, that's not all. Once they arrived at that point, then they had to calculate the angle of the thrusters and the length of the burn in order to enter the moon's orbit. And guess what? If they didn't burn long enough, they were going to fall short, and they would intersect the moon. You know what a rocket looks like or a spaceship looks like when it intersects the moon? Crashes. That's what intersecting the moon is. If, if they burned it too long and, and they uh, got up too much speed and at the wrong angle, they would miss the moon completely and they would be off into outer space, never to return, supposedly. Although you did have people on the ground waiting, waiting to finally make contact, waiting to hear from them once they... Uh, got out into space if that happened or if they fell short and they were crashing towards the moon and they were going to make these instantaneous calculations to try to make some corrections to save uh, the mission. They made their burn and they started their orbit. And, and NASA, they were on the ground and they knew, they knew how long it was going to take. They knew we've got like nine minutes here, and the antennas, they're going to be back in range. We'll, we'll talk to them again. So they said, here we go. We're making the burn. All of a sudden, the radio went silent because they, they didn't have the antenna reception anymore. You know what the guy in mission control said, the, the head honcho there? He said, all right, guys, bathroom break. They looked around. What? You, you don't understand what's happening right here? This is the most critical time. We can't communicate with them anyway. And they said, Oh, well, that's a good idea. So they all headed out, went to the bathroom, came back, got back to their stations. The clock went down to zero. Apollo 8, this is mission control, come in. No answer. They continued that for a couple of minutes. They knew they're supposed to be, be in range by now. They didn't hear from them, and they were suspecting the worst. And all of a sudden... Mission Control, this is Apollo 8. We achieved orbit. These masterful, genius minds flawlessly entered orbit. Next slide. As they were coming around the moon, they saw Earthrise. That's what this picture has been titled, Earthrise. One of the most famous pictures in NASA history is they saw their home planet come into view. And, and they, they had a small window on each side, and they were trying to see it, and they were just in awe. And Jim Lovell, he would put his thumb up to the viewfinder and put the earth behind his thumb, and he would say, everything I know and love, I can put behind my thumb. You'll recall when the Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin when he first went into space, he confirmed that he did not see God while he was there. It's what he said when he came back to earth. I didn't see God. <laughs> Listen to this. December 24th, 1968. 
some of the most intelligent minds of that time. And, and Jim Lovell, being one of these intelligent minds, he, he was admittedly not a religious man. He observed what they had witnessed during this space flight, and they were sending a broadcast back to Earth. It was the largest televised broadcast of that time. More people were tuned in than any other time. And before the largest television audience in history at that time, Jim Lovell said to the people back on Earth, Merry Christmas, and we have a message for you. And Jim started, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the three astronauts took turns reading Genesis 1, 1 through 10. At Johnson, uh, at Johnson Space Center and Mission Control, everybody was standing up. Some people were crying. Nobody knew that they were going to do that. It was a total surprise. They were speechless. And even without a strong religious thought process, they had a spiritual self-identity at that time. There was almost a default in these United States that said, we are unashamed to declare the word of God to the entire world. You know, sometimes people today, they say that Christians, people that try to preach and teach and share the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're probably not very bright. Because if you're really bright and really smart and really intelligent, they would say, you understand that there is no God. It wasn't that way in 1968. These guys were unashamed. Let's go to the next slide. We could probably say more about Apollo 8, but I want you to go listen to the podcast, and we're going to move on to the next story. This is another example Staying with the context of uh, identity and being unashamed. Who, who are we? Who are we tonight? And why should we be unashamed? Anybody ever see the movie Wonder? If you haven't seen it, it's on Netflix, I'm pretty sure. If you have Netflix, look it up and see it. Uh, it's, a, it's a movie about a young man. His name is August Pullman, and they called him Augie. Uh, go to the next slide. Let's see. I believe I've got his... Uh, yeah, there it is. So... He, he was born with a condition called, do we have any doctors in here? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to say this name. If I mess it up, you can correct me later. Uh, uh, mandibulofacial uh, dysotosis. It's a condition that's very rare. It occurs in about one in every 50,000 births. Uh, next slide. Uh, kids, parents, they didn't want, parents didn't want their kids to be around him because of the way his his face was and, and the scars that he had and the disformation. So somebody bought him a space helmet as a gift. And he enjoyed wearing the space helmet. So he put on the space helmet, he'd go out on the playground and, and nobody knew that he had a problem. So people would high five him and play with him. It was great. That was his security blanket. Uh, next slide. So he had been homeschooled until fifth grade. On the first day of fifth grade, uh, he was headed to school and, of course, he's got his helmet on because, like I said, that's his security blanket. Mom and dad are there with him. Go to the next slide. Uh, it, it's a very emotional day for Augie because this is out of his comfort zone. He, he's got a, a sister here, Olivia. I think they call her Via in the movie. And, and in this scene, you, you see her get down and whisper something to him. And this is what you hear. You hear her say... Can you hear me? Then we don't hear what she says to him. <laughs> Next slide. Now, Augie and his dad, they have a moment. Uh, the, the parent walks over. Augie's going to have to go the rest of the way on his own. And, and his dad tells him, he says, you got to take the helmet off. Helmets aren't cool. The other fifth graders, they're, they're not going to think it's cool that you've got a space helmet on. So he gives up the space helmet. And then, and then the story takes some time to introduce some other characters. For instance, his sister Olivia. And then we rewind the show 
back to that next scene. Go to the next slide there. And we hear what she says to him. Let this sink in for just a minute. The words she says to him, Augie, if they stare, let them stare. You cannot blend in when you were born to stand out. Anybody hear a sermon title there? We could make a sermon title out of that, couldn't we? You cannot blend in when you were born to stand out. So anyway, here he goes. Go to the next slide. It's just like you expected. He's walking down the halls at school, and uh, there's some meanness that begins in middle school. And if you've got a, ever had a middle schooler, you know that it can be pretty tough. Here's some of the things he hears. Don't touch him. You'll get the plague. August, you look like an animal when you eat. Who's your favorite character in Star Wars? Darth Sidious? No one will sit with him. Nobody will talk to him. Augie's left in tears. Next slide. He did manage to get one friend, and this friend's name was Jack Will. Jack was able to look past the scars. He got to know and got to appreciate Augie Pullman. For the moment, it's just Jack and Jack alone. The rest of the school, they're still afraid of catching the plague. Next slide. It's Halloween. Halloween's a good time for him because guess what? They get to wear costumes to school. Once again, he can cover his face up and it's okay and it's cool to be that way. And he gets to school and he's going down and he's high-fiving. He's having a good time. And Next slide. Because they had the mask on, some kids didn't know Augie was in the room. And he overheard one of them say, if I had a face like that, I'd kill myself. That's a lot. Go to the next slide. They're eating lunch, and Jack Will, he's sitting down talking to Augie, and he says, man, have you ever thought about having plastic surgery? And Augie's got a good sense of humor, and Augie, he's taking all this in stride, and Augie's growing, and he says, dude, this is after plastic surgery. It takes a lot of work to look this good. Next slide. At the end of the school year, Augie receives an award and a standing ovation because of the way he saw himself. Self-identity, self-image, you've heard those, self-esteem, uh, our, our self-image, that's how you see yourself, your self-esteem, that's how you feel about what you see. Because of the way Augie saw himself, he developed a self-identity when he determined, when he determined to be unashamed of who he was, and others began to see him in a different way too. So let's go look at a Bible story and let's make a little application from this. Today we're going to look at a character. Uh, his name is Joseph of Arimathea, and we don't know a whole lot about Joseph of Arimathea because there's just a very few words that are written about him. Each one of the four gospel accounts talk about Joseph of Arimathea. But if we look at each account, it gives some different details. And we begin to appreciate him. So let's look at Matthew chapter 27, verses 57 through 60. You can go to the next slide. Next slide. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus he went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him, and Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen shroud, and laid it in his own tomb, which he had cut in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Here's one thing we learn about Joseph of Arimathea. He's a rich man. He's, there, he, he's got uh, some respect that he gets when people see him walking down the street. This uh, uh, pilot, pilot he, he was a, an officiant there in the city. And Joseph of Arimathea, he's got so much respect in the town and people know, he can ask for an audience with this top government official the same day and he gets it. This, this is a, 
Joseph of Arimathea, he's a pretty important man. He's a rich man. It also tells us he's a disciple of Jesus, and that's, that's kind of interesting too. You know, we know that Pilate initially, he, he, he didn't want to kill Jesus. He, he said he was an innocent man. I'm going to send him to Herod. Herod sends it back to him. He's, you know, Pilate's trying to dodge this whole thing. But we learn that he's a rich man. He's a disciple of Jesus. And, and, and what's asked of him, it's given to him. Joseph took the body. The body was given to him, and Joseph took it. And uh, the things that he did with it are things that are fulfilled according to the Scriptures. But we're trying to learn about Joseph of Arimathea here. Rich man. Also a follower of Jesus. Turn to Mark chapter 15. In verses 42 through 46. A pretty similar reading. I, I like, by the way, I like the book of Mark. Mark's only got 16 chapters. You can sit down and read it in just a few minutes. And, and Mark, like Luke, tells the events of the life of Jesus in the order that they happened. Matthew and John kind of skip around a little bit. But Matthew and Luke, they, they have it in order. That's kind of interesting. But let, let's look at this. I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing again. Uh, but I'm just going to point out a few things because I think uh, you understand the story and the, the general sense of what's happening. When evening had come, it was the day of preparation. That's the day before the Sabbath. Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council. Okay, so he's not just a rich man and a follower of Jesus. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. You know who the Sanhedrin is. That's that group of 70 men that said, we want to put Jesus to death. He's a member of that group who also himself, looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate. Okay, now I'm getting another sense here of something that's happening. This was probably not a healthy, physically healthy thing for Joseph of Arimathea to do because his team back here They've decided to put Jesus to death. And guess what? Now there's followers of Jesus out here. We, we want to go get them too. But Joseph of Arimathea, he, 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 took his, he took his one trump card that he had of being uh, rich and a member of the council and being respected, and he spent it going to Pilate and asking for the body of Jesus at great risk to himself and his family. He took courage. Same thing, he gets the... Let's see, th this, this passage says that Pilate, summoning the centurion, asked whether he was already dead. And then when he learned he was dead, he granted the corpse to him. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud. Joseph had to get up on that cross and physically take Jesus down. I don't know if he removed the spikes. I don't know if he... I don't know how he did that. But I do know handling a dead body by yourself is not easy. It can't be. When, when I was in course at Mars Hill, uh, we, would, we would do course programs, and we had a, a stack of three levels of risers that would unfold and, and raise up. And then we had a fourth riser, standalone. You'd have to break those out individually, and then it had a little clamp that you'd clamp it to the one in the front. Jim Stanley always told us, don't lock your knees when you're on the risers. So I made sure I didn't lock my knees. Well, we were singing a song one day, and I'm on the top riser, and this guy next to me kind of leans over on me. I'm like, don't do that. Pushed him back, and here he comes again, and I turn and look at him. He has passed out. And, and I think, well, I'm going to catch him and so I turn around and I put my arms under his. Guess what? When somebody's unconscious, they don't hold their arms down and help you. His arms went... And he went right down. I, I slowed his fall, but he went down. People that are lifeless, they don't help you. Imagine Joseph of Arimathea getting up on that cross and taking Jesus down. No doubt he got blood on him. He came in contact with a dead body. It's the day of preparation. He won't be able to participate in any of the Sabbath activities because he's unclean now. Luke chapter 23. 
Luke chapter 23, verses 50 through 54. There's a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea, a member of the council. Uh, we understand that. A good and righteous man. There's something new about, Nick, about uh, Joseph of Arimathea. He's a good man. He's a righteous man. He's a rich man. He's a respected man. He's a member of the council. And one who had not consented to their decision and action. I don't, I don't know how this went down. I don't know if the Sanhedrin, if they were gathered in a room and they said, who else is ever killing Jesus? Raise your hand. Anybody raise their hand except for Joseph? Or was it a secret ballot? Did they, did they pass it around and say, uh, should we kill Jesus? And you put yes or no, and they're opening up and say, yes, 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 yes. Remember, we've got 70 of them to go through. No. Who voted no? He did not consent to their decision and action. He was looking for the kingdom of God. It, we, we know there were Pharisees that were looking for the kingdom of God, but they were uh, afraid to confess Jesus' name publicly because it's going to hurt their influence. It's going to hurt their power. Yet Joseph, he goes to Pilate on this day of all days. John chapter 19, verses 38 through 40. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. I, I imagine he probably wasn't the only one, but he's the one that we're talking about tonight. He asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Oh, Nicodemus also. I guess there were two no votes in the Sanhedrin. Boy, what a great feeling that must have been. Here, here you are. You're, you're, you're stepping out on a day. There's, there's every reason why you just lay low and, and, and not profess that you're a follower of Jesus. Yet, yet he was unashamed in, in, in spite of the potential danger to step up and go see Pilate and share that he was a follower of Jesus, share that he was a disciple, to go and get Jesus. And I wonder what it must have felt like to show up there at the cross and turn and, oh, man, I'm not the only one. Nicodemus, my friend, he's here with me. And, and Nicodemus, he had brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight, and uh, they wrapped the body of Jesus. They took the body of Jesus. He had help getting that body off the cross. We were in uh, Italy. Uh, my wife and I and my uh, daughter, Emma. And, and we were going through one of the cathedrals there and had a tour guide. And, and there was one of the body of Jesus coming off the cross. And she was talking about Jesus. And she was talking about Joseph of Arimathea being there. She didn't say anything about Nicodemus. Uh, I finally asked her, I said, so this, this is Nicodemus on the other side, right? She got all excited. Yes, yes, that's who that is. She was, I don't know why she wasn't sharing that anyway, but uh, yeah, he had some help. I wonder. <laughs> the Bible doesn't tell us. I, w I wonder what it must have looked like when Joseph went in to see Pilate. He makes an appointment that day, and uh, hey, uh, secretary tells Pilate, he said, uh, Joseph Arimathea, he, he wants to come see you. Well, absolutely, bring him in, bring him in. Hey, let's, let's get some tea and cakes out here, and we're going to, uh, you know, I bet, I bet I know why he's here. I just, I just granted their wish to, you know, take Jesus and do what they wanted to with him. So he's probably here to thank me or to offer some praise. You know, it's, it's very important to Pilate that, he keeps the Sanhedrin happy because 
If they're not happy and they get the Jews all riled up, then his boss looks down and says, all right, Pilate, you're out of a job. So he's like, you know, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. So that, that's what's happening here. So he's all excited. His, his buddy, his buddy Joseph Arimathea, he's coming in. Pilate, maybe he greets him and says, Joseph, what can I do for you? Joseph says, I'd like the body of Jesus. See, I'm a, I'm a disciple. Pilate probably would have looked at him. And just, just understanding how conversations go, uh, maybe, maybe this is how it went. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me right now? You, you understand what just happened, don't you? And, and, and you've seen how this crowd has been worked up into a frenzy. They, they might come and get you. Are you not worried about your family? I don't know how it went down. The Bible doesn't tell us, but maybe that's the conversation they had. Joseph, he was unashamed. He was a rich man, a disciple of Jesus. Let's go to the next slide. If I have another one. Yeah, I just kind of consolidated these. Think about these characteristics of Joseph Bermuda. Rich man, respected man. He's respected. I'll bet every person in here right now has respect from somebody or some group somewhere along the way. Maybe, maybe you're a, a manager or a director or a boss or a foreman, a parent, a grandparent, uh, active in school. But we understand what it's like to, to, to get some respect and for people to want to be around us and want to listen to us and give us their time. He was a disciple of Jesus. We're all disciples of Jesus, aren't we? He was a disciple secretly because of the Jews. I, I wonder, do we have any secret agents in here? Are there some people that maybe when you get out in public you don't want others to really know? You're a dedicated follower of Jesus, so you kind of just blend in. He was a respected council member. He, he associated with some people that had no respect for Jesus, and, and they respected him. So when he was around his closest friends, his closest companions, he didn't let them know. But things are changing for Joseph. He's looking for the kingdom of God. He's a good and righteous man. Takes some courage. I'm ready to step out. And let people know who I am and what I stand for. Even among his friends, he did not consent to their decision and action. If my little two-year-old daughter were in here, uh, we could probably cue up uh, a song from Frozen conceal, don't feel, don't let them know. Well, now they know. Well, that's what's happened with Joseph Arimathea here. He was concealing it, and he was going about life just like everything was fine and peachy and hunky-dory. Not going to let them know. Well, guess what? Now they know. It's time to step up and unashamedly be a follower of Jesus. And I'll close with, do I have another slide? Yeah. Let's close with this. Those little words that were spoken to Augie. You know, if, if you act like a Christian, talk like a Christian, behave like a Christian, some people might think we're a little unusual. If they stare, let them stare. You know what? You can't blend in when you were born to stand out. I think as a, as a godly man, I believe we can be the best we can be to our family as a leader in the home if we don't blend in, if we decide to be unashamed and stand out for Jesus. I want to go to heaven. I know you want to go to heaven. Our, our lesson tonight, it, it hasn't been one that has uh, uh, spoken the gospel. But I'll tell you the gospel. Jesus loves you. He died. 
He was buried according to the scriptures. He rose again on the third day. He did that because he loves you. Obedience to the gospel involves the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We die and we're buried and we're raised again in baptism. Baptism, according to Colossians 2, 11, and 12, it's the place where our sins are cut off. So if you're not a Christian tonight, there's not a lot you need to know. You need to know you have sin in your life. You need to know that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Confess His name before men and be immersed. Turn away from those sins. You can be a Christian. There may be somebody here that you are a child of God. Maybe you haven't been walking the walk. Maybe you haven't been talking the talk. And maybe because you just... I don't tell you what. I just don't want to stand out. I don't want people to stare at me. I, you know, it's, it's just easier that way. And I'm just going to be a real quiet Christian. And maybe you want to change that tonight and be unashamed of who you are. Or maybe in a group this size, there's somebody that there, there, there's no sin problem going on. There's nothing like that. But you, you've got something you're struggling with in your life. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, you know what? Why am I trying to do this by myself? What if I, I came, down, came up here and told about 40 of my forever family about what's going on in my life and just going to bed tonight knowing that they're all praying about it? We'll make tonight a better night. I don't know what your needs might be. But there's been an invitation song selected. And, and the words of that song, they were written to be an encouragement. And, and we're going to stand to be an encouragement. And, and if there is a need, something that you need to make right, I, I hope you'll do that. Unashamedly, come to Jesus while we stand and sing. Hello, my name is Philip Goad, and I'm privileged to serve as the preacher here at North Highlands Church of Christ. You may have heard something in today's message that has you asking some questions, either about the topic we just covered or maybe about our North Highlands Church family. If so, we'd love to hear from you. Please reach out. We'd love to field your question. In fact, we'd love to set up a time to study the Bible with you. And if you're interested in that, we'll set up a time that works well for you. I'd also like to invite you to come out and connect with us in person. We'd love for you to worship with us. Sunday mornings at 930, we have worship followed by Bible classes for all ages. We come back on Sunday evenings at six o'clock for another time of Bible study. And then on Wednesdays, we have two opportunities. We have a 2 p.m. Bible study for folks who don't need to be out uh, in the evening. And then at 6.30 p.m., we also have a Bible study time, classes for all ages. The other thing I'd like to mention is that we have a food bank. It's open the third Saturday of each month from nine to 10 a.m. And so if you know of somebody in our community, in our county, uh, that would be able to take advantage of this, please pass the word about the Food Bank at North Highlands, third Saturday from 9 to 10 a.m. Again, we thank you for connecting with us today, and we hope you'll be back online connected with us again very soon.